So I'm pushing live now. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies to 49 and less people across the United States. Our guest today is Bonnie Tinder. Bonnie, are you ready to be great today? I absolutely, every day. For over 25 years, Bonnie has worked with top human resources software companies, leading implementation, marketing, and sales initiatives. Bonnie was most recently an, an industry and competitive intelligence analyst and helped to build vendor messaging and sales effectiveness programs. In 2018, she founded Raven Intel, a peer review site for enterprise software consulting designed to help customers make well-informed choices in an, implement, in an inter, implementation partner. Bonnie, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, and I, for some reason, I keep on to call you Raven, but I know your name's Bonnie, right? <laughs> hey, that's close <laughs> enough. I, it's like a great pseudonym. I'll take it. So, Bonnie, um, you're pretty active on LinkedIn. And on February 26th, you wrote an article talking about six reasons your enterprise software program, uh, project is late. Can you mm -hmm. expand on that and why you wrote that article? Yeah. Um, first of all, I would tell you that approximately half of enterprise software projects are late. So this is not a, you know, a, um, an infrequent thing that happens. Most software projects go over the amount of time that uh, customers had really banked for. And what we see on um, our site is uh, customers really providing feedback as to why that happened. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, the project was overly ambitious to begin with. And um, I think so many people go into an enterprise software project with um, you know, a, just a really ambitious schedule um, and thinking that they're gonna be able to dedicate 100% of their time to completing the, the project, um, kind of forgetting that they have another job as well. And so in a lot of cases, the project um, is scoped initially on too tight of a, of a time frame, And people, uh, I think, overestimate the amount of time uh, that they are able to spend on the project and underestimate um, the, the challenges that, that come up during a software project. Um, and so I, I think that that's probably the biggest one. You know, I, I think we, we, in that article that you mentioned, had six of the main things that we hear but I would say number one is just, uh, you know, sort of an overly ambitious idea going in on, on how much time these actually take. And then looking at both sides, how much is like, it's going to be my own tech startup now. And it's like always if a tech person says, I haven't done it in a week, pretty much whatever they say, you need at least double, right? So how much is that? And how much is it the, 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 the person with the company adding extra stuff on that's not in the scope of work? Absolutely. And I think, you know, also being a, a, a business founder, I think you don't anticipate how long things will take um, initially. Um, and, you know, I think this is just every project, whether it is, you know, trying to get your initial tech stack built or um, even, you know, we're doing a bathroom project right now, a bathroom redo. And, you know, we're getting quotes from contractors that'll say, oh, the work will be done in two weeks, but we know in the back of our minds that that's really going to be a month that we're going to be without this bathroom. Um, because, you know, even in a bathroom remodel or a house remodel, they always say double the amount of time that you think it's going to take and then maybe double it from there as well uh, in some cases. So I think, you know, it, enterprise software implementation is similar to really any change um, in that, you know, I just, I think as humans, we, you know, we, we like to be on the positive side of things and, and think that, um, you know, with enough energy and enthusiasm, we're going to be able to tackle a project in a shorter period of time. And that usually is not the case. Bonnie, can you find what exactly is enterprise? Like what size company is enterprise? Yeah. You know, um, it's a, it's sort of a loose definition, but 
when I think of enterprise software, I think of software that a company uses um, internally. So it's a business type of software. Um, and typically that, that software, definitely on Brave and Intel that we're looking at is, is cloud-based as well. Uh, when you talk about an enterprise sized business, that's a sort of a different definition, um, which is, you know, to me, that's any organization that has a thousand employees and, um, and above. But enterprise software typically is a B2B software system um, that we're talking about. I would have to think with the, with the enterprise size company, just the inbound bureaucracy of the company has to have an effect on the selecting vendors and the information too, right? I'm sure there's like many, many checkpoints they have to go through to even get it approved, correct? Yeah. Well, we always say there's, there's two major decisions that you have in, um, in a good software decision. Number one is you have to pick the right software. And certainly you have to look at things like feature and function and the vendor that you're going to be dealing with and, you know, what is their track record of success? What industry um, verticals do they focus on? And are all of those things um, good, you know, a match for the, the business and project that you have at hand? So that's one part of the equation is choosing the right software. But then I think the other part, which is equally as important, is choosing um, the implementation path that you go on and the partner that you choose to help guide your implementation. And with a lot of these big enterprise software systems, um, you, they, they, those software vendors rely on a third party consulting company to help get those projects live. And so if you do not choose the right partner to help you, that right third party partner to help you with the implementation effort, doesn't matter if you chose a great software in step one, it's not going to, you know, be properly implemented and properly adopted within your organization if you don't choose the right implementation partner. So it's the two, two, two decisions, two big decisions. From your point of view at a company, should HR lead the implementation or IT should lead the implementation of HR software? In, in terms of the selection process? Selection is implemented across the company. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it needs to be a collaborative effort. And I've seen, um, I've seen both instances and I've seen success cases in both instances. I've seen failures in both instances. You know, at the end of the day, the, the HR team is going to live with that software. They're going to ultimately be on the hook for the implementation and the, you know, the employee experience with it that reflects that digital experience is going to reflect on the HR department if it's an HR decision. Um, and so if HR is not um, really the driver in, in, in that case and is, isn't able to have you know, specific things that they are able to get from the, um, the selection process, um, that's gonna be problematic. Um, with that said, if HR is making all of the, you know, leading the decision process and doesn't have the collaboration of IT, when it comes time to implementing and all of a sudden IT has to start dedicating resources to the project and feel like, you know, they, they weren't the part of the decision process and now they have to support an application that doesn't really fit with their specifications or with the bandwidth that they have to support, that's gonna be problematic as well. So I think in, in terms of the software selection piece of things, HR really needs to um, you know, have the, the needs uh, of, that need to be met during the, you know, during a, you know, in, in the system itself and you know, how they're going to utilize the system internally, roll it out, et cetera. But IT needs to be part and parcel to that process to make sure that they're on board once you know implementation starts um, because even in the cloud no matter what vendors will say the effort from IT in um, you know making sure that things are set up properly from the beginning um, it's it's not as if oh it's in the cloud and our software vendor is hosting it so 
you know, IT can, you know, just be along for the ride. That's absolutely not true. IT needs to embrace the product as well as, um, you know, have availability to help in implementation. Bonnie, with so many HR vendors out there, how does it come even pick which one to use, right? I mean, literally like hundreds of thousands, how do you go with all the noise and pick the right one for you, right? It's, that's close to impossible, isn't it? it well, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's impossible. I think, um, you know, I, I think to me, what's the most important is that you are, are looking at a, a system that fits um, and, and can deliver on the business case and the end result that you were looking for. You work backwards from there. Um, I think that that makes the playing field a lot smaller. Because yes, as you mentioned, software vendors are a dime a dozen. There are thousands of HR software vendors. It's a fragmented market. And if you're in HR and looking for a system, you can make a full-time job of looking and inviting software vendors to come in and uh, show you what they have. On the other hand, if you come in with a perspective and sort of what your end result should look like, and then you do your initial due diligence uh, before you call a vendor in based upon, you know, that sort of, um, that, that uh, um, foundation, let's say, um, and you talk to peers in your industry first, I think that that's going to create a smaller universe from which to start from. So you can, you know, look at, you know, let's say you come up with a list of five vendors that sort of fit within the scope that you're looking for. Um, and then you can, you know, condense your process um, down to the point where it's going gonna, it's gonna to make sense and that you're not getting too much, um, you know, too many different points of view and too many vendors that really aren't going to fit the bill uh, that, that sort of waste your time from the beginning. I think, again, you can really accelerate your process if you come up with sort of your best view from the early part and then go deep with each one of them to make your final selection. And, and this is a important decision, right? You have to pretty much get this right because if you, get a, you make, make the wrong decision in a year and you decide this is not the right platform for us, you waste all the money, all the time, and now you got to find a new one and then go all over again. So it's important to get it right the first time if you can, right? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And in a lot of cases, if you make the wrong decision and cost enough money within your organization, your, your own neck is going to be on the line as well. So you, you know, not only from a cost perspective, um, but credibility perspective that you have, your brand, your internal name is on that decision. And so you want to make sure that that you make the right one. Bonnie, why did you start Raven and Tail? So I spent 25 years in the HR software industry, um, and I worked for uh, many of the the main players in in the HR um, space, uh, HR software vendors. And what I continued to see throughout my career, right, 25 years. Even though software changed, the implementation experience was a big problem. And everybody hates implementation. No, nobody likes it. No matter, even the, the good implementations, at the end of the day, it's still an implementation. And they're really tough. And I felt like customers had no idea, because they, you, know, you don't change your HR software every year, or even every five years in some cases. Customers had no idea how to, they, they could pick the right software, but really didn't have any independent resources to pick the right consulting partner to help guide them so that they had a good implementation. And, you know, while there was like places like a G2 crowd and, you know, the other peer review sites for software, nothing existed out there for implementation and consulting partners. So that really where, where I started from was I wanted to be able to make it for you know, customers to be able to make a wise choice in a consulting partner. And then you know, on the, the, the other side of the coin too, I wanted software vendors who relied on all of these partners to do the work to be able to have like an independent voice or uh, an independent set of um, 
uh, you know, oversight that gave them sort of reports back as to who their best partners were, what their customers were saying. Because a lot of in a lot of cases, these software vendors were going out and selling their software and had no idea at you know how the customers um, fared after the software sale was done. And so, you know, we, as much as we serve customers, we serve uh, software vendors and helping them really get a bird's eye view on their partner ecosystem and know who their best partners are, who the partners that they need to kick out of their ecosystem are because their customers are not happy. Um, you know, and, and we, give, we give these consulting firms a, a platform to really showcase the great work that they are doing for customers as well and get in front of more customers because of the quality of their work, not just because, you know, um, you know, they, they spend a ton of money on advertising and, and things like that. We are really trying to give um, the, the best customers the biggest voice on our platform. And, and so all of those, those things, I, I sense those were just, those needs were not being filled in the industry. And so I'm like, I, nobody else is doing it. I'm going to do it. So that's great. Thank you. So from your time in HR software, what has become better and what has gotten worse? Um, you know, I think what has gotten better is the user experience. Um, and I think about, you know, the current situation that we're in right now where, um, you know, so many um, employees, employers are working from home and how, much more difficult things would have been um, even five years ago before all of these applications could be available, you know, is if you could get to an internet browser. And so I think in terms of the overall user experience and the ability to sort of um, deploy uh, the software um, far and wide and to enable things like work from home and um, you know, a mobile experience. In all of those regards, I think HR software um, and that the user experience has really improved. Um, I think what has gotten worse um, is related to why things have gotten better is getting all of these systems to talk to one another. So you have a, you might have a great solution for, um, you know, one piece of your HR experience, but then, you know, your, let's say your learning platform is separate, separate from that, or, you know, you need your um, HR system to talk to, um, you know, another facet within your business. And the integrations um, are, are very complex. And because so many customers are supporting multiple products, or, you know, they're, even in some cases they have Excel spreadsheets for some things and then they have a good, you know, um, let's say HR admin system, getting all of the pieces to talk to one other because there's so many layers and there's so many different tools that sort of need to sync up. I think that has be, has gotten worse. And this idea of a tech stack that is just too big and unwieldy um, is, is a is a big challenge, both, both for users, because they now have multiple sign-ins, but for the overall admin and for you know, HR departments and IT departments to be able to report on all of these things together, um, it's, I think it's more challenging. How, how much is the challenge that like most HR people are not really tech savvy, right? How much do you think that plays into it? I, I, think, I think good uh, HR leaders, good HR practitioners, are tech savvy. And if they're not super tech savvy themselves, um, they need to hire a team that understands the digital experience and, um, and certainly HR data and analytics. Because without those things, um, it, again, the modern uh, employee experience and employee engagement and, you know, sort of this idea of um, empowering employees, developing employees today without um, a really good handle on, on how your digital footprint is in HR. Um, if you don't have that, um, you're not going to last long within, within the department. So I think good HR practi practitioners 
um, need to be, in order to be relevant, need to be tech savvy or have a great tech savvy team that they've hired. And I've got to say for like nowadays, especially like the new generation coming up, they do everything on the cell phones, right? Or mobile phone, iPad. So if your HR platform is not mobile friendly, it's, it's pretty important. I think you're wasting your time, right? Without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, everybody wants a, an experience that you can, um, you know, look at um, on, a, on a mobile device um, and do easily that way. I mean, especially now that everything is, um, you know, distributed workforce and continued probably direction where people are gonna be working from home for a, a long time. I think if you don't have mobile enablement, uh, it, it's going to be a judgment long term. Why does it seem that so many vendors are not meeting the expectations of the customers? Um, you mean software vendors or yeah, software vendors? vendors? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, where where we see customers rating their vendor experience poorly. It's when they haven't been clear about the um, what the tech roadmap looks like and clear about the uh, the business case for the, the product that they're providing um, and so the expectations during the sales process you know that somebody has about a particular product, you know, all the features and functions are sold in one way, but then delivered by a completely different team um, that the customer in a lot of cases has to re-explain their use cases and what they, you know, had, had talked about during the sales process. So there's this disconnect between, um, you know, from sales handoff to the customer experience. And, you know, I think there's a, re you know, in cases where there's a gap where a customer feels like they were sold something different than was actually put in place, um, that's where the, the real initial um, discontent starts happening. Even if the implementation, you know, is able to solve some things that sows the seeds, I think, eventually for a, a relationship that, that is, you know, starts off on the wrong foot. So um, I think a, a difference between expectations and reality is probably what I would say number one is. So Bonnie, can you talk about what a tech roadmap is real, real fast? I think most people don't know what that is. Mm. Um, so if someone says, hey, that would be a great feature um, that we'd like to have in your product, and the software company says, you're right, a lot of customers are asking for that, um, we're going to put it on the roadmap that then puts it in um, queue essentially to be worked on at a later date. And it's a future that 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 roadmap is sort of like the future of the software is going to look like this in, you know, next quarter or next year or whatever the, the roadmap tells you. But the roadmap is, is the future direction of a software. Um, and also here is a, a difference in expectation versus reality. Some vendors will say, we'll put that on the roadmap. It's going to happen in Q2 2021. And then Q2 2021 happens and they're like, oh, well, we're going to actually push that into Q4 or, you know, we had other things that came up that took precedence, et cetera. So, um, you know, a roadmap um, in some cases is a little bit like, um, aspirational, um, but I think, you know, good software companies have a, a roadmap that really sort of, um, you know, is, 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 is less aspirational than it is realistic. Yes. Um, Bonnie, so there's like so many HR tech companies out there, out there, and when people, they think of tech, they think of modern, you know, futuristic, but despite this, HR still has a stigma of being old, traditional, old school, why this disconnect? Why is HR still known as being like old and traditional? How come, you know, because there's so many HR tech companies out there, what's this disconnect going on for? Yeah, well, I mean, I think part of it is, is it, HR is legacy, right? It's, um, they, every department has had their, you know, 
HR software, HR department, HR function evolve over time. And in some cases, the evolution is a lot quicker in some areas than it is in others. So maybe some parts of the business, HR has a great user experience, um, you know, maybe for the professional workforce, but then for workers that are, you know, in, you know, maybe um, that, that aren't accessing a computer as part of their core job, you know, and the, now they're having to fill out paper or go to some, you know, old kiosk or something like that. That that experience hasn't yet caught up to the other parts of the business, and so I think um, you know the moving things as now our technology in general. Um, you know, as as workers, we we expect everything you know to be available on our handheld device, even you know if HR hasn't caught up with that. That's in my mind shows uh, you know if I, if I'm a worker. And I have a mobile device, in fact, but I'm not working in front of a computer. My expectation is that then, you know, HR is behind if, if you're not able to communicate with me in the same way as, you know, I can access my, my YouTube or my Facebook or something like that. I remember when I left the Army, one of my first HR jobs I had, people in the office were actually like, they, they were printing stuff out from the computer, making pen and ink changes on the paper and then typing those changes in the computer. It's like, this is like 2016. I almost like passed, like, what are y'all doing? Like, and, but they had, they had no clue, right? They had no clue what, what's going on, right? And they're like, so I saw them Google Drive. Oh, this is great. I mean, this has been, I was like, it's been like 10, 20 years, right? It's like, yeah. I was like, but you don't know what you don't know, I guess. Or, or you don't, if you don't want, you want to learn something new, you're going to be stuck in old times, I guess. But that was, just, that was just very funny for me. It's, it's true. And I feel that within the last, you know, two or three years, our own, um, user experience has changed so much with consumer apps and availability of, you know, things like Amazon and, um, you know, and we just, we just expect everything to have, you know, um, mobile interface and, and deliverability um, and things like that, uh, you know, this, this sort of modern um, ordering experience for, for things like that. And you know, as soon as you have a taste of that, you're like, well, why can't everything be as simple as, you know, ordering lunch from Grubhub in like 10 seconds, you know, so. Exactly. How come I can't, keep, how come I can't pick my benefits broker, you know, but I push the app, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Bonnie, you talked some about your company. Can you talk now about your vision for your company? Like what the future, what you want the future to be for your company? Yeah. Um, so we have, um, we've been in, in business just a little bit over two years, and it's really exciting to see sort of the progress that we have made over these two years. So on a regular basis, we have over 16,000 visitors to our website. We have over 200 partners or consulting partners who are profiled on our site. Um, we have seven major um, software vendors who are represented in those 200 partners. And um, we have over 600 reviews that are available for customers to read out there. So over the last two years, things have really, um, I think we're gaining momentum now and people know that we um, exist. And so we want to continue that where every HR um, uh, buyer or every H anybody within the HR function that would make a decision for an HR software comes to our site as, and uses it as a resource for free. Um, so I, you know, I want to see a continuance in that evolution. Um, we are, we are going in the future as we're expanding past HR. So we're looking at um, any large enterprise software that is implemented. Um, so we're looking at financials now and supply chain management, CRM, because at the end of the day, what we're measuring is a project go live or, you know, the software implementation experience. And, um, you know, there's definitely nuances for HR and there's nuances for finance and things like that. But the overall project effort and what we're measuring is similar. And I think there's a lot of benefit to having um, 
that scale on the site that provides, we're able to look at projects and whether it's HR or finance, say, was this a good project, yes or no? So um, I think the future is scaling beyond just HR to all enterprise software. So we're gonna get salesforce.com on our site and other financial systems um, out there as well. Bunny, can you talk about your own entrepreneurial journey? Like why did you decide to become an entre entrepreneur? Why startups? I mean, why make that big jump as they say? So I've always wanted to start my own business. Um, it's been sort of a lifelong dream. And, um, you know, I had, you know, close to 25 years where I, I sort of built my career and, you know, I, um, you know, sort of had this notion that like, you know, my, my dream was to be like a chief marketing officer for a big company. I thought, oh man, if that, if I could do that, I would have made it. And what I really realized, I think through my sort of corporate career journey is that what I loved most about work was number one, being able to create something, but number two, more seeing the results and, you know, after creating it, sort of getting like the acceptance for it and seeing something that I had an idea for take off. And so, you know, marketing definitely has a, a, a lot of that. But I, what I realized most is that I love the tech side and really this, this sort of idea of, of creating a business around an idea. Um, and so you know, a couple of years ago, um, or, you know, as I was really working in, in my last job, I, I had this like idea that just, just continued to like eat at me. Like that was like, nobody is fixing this. And that's sort of why the timing, um, of it is I just saw this opportunity out there to, to do something that nobody else was doing. Um, but with that said, you know, if I hadn't started a business, whether it was, you know, this one or something else, you know, and got to the end of my working years and, and hadn't done it, I would have been really disappointed. Um, and I would say, you know, no matter what happens, um, you know, this is always something that, um, like, was, was I had to do. I mean, it was just, it's, it's part of who I am. And if I didn't do it, I, I would have, like, looked back and, and had regrets. So, um, yeah. So, Bonnie, um, Talk about something on your entrepreneurial journey, whether it's good or bad, that you totally did not, did not expect, right? Like it's totally coming out of left field and like, man, I didn't expect this as part of being an entrepreneurial journey. And it could be something good that happened or something bad that happened. Yeah. Um, okay. I, 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 can, I can give you about a hundred examples for, for each. And I think as an entrepreneur, um, the, you don't know what you don't know until you've actually gone through it the first couple of years and probably the first time that you are an entrepreneur, you, you learn a lot of hard lessons, and which I did um, myself. I, I think um, the, um, something that I, I didn't expect was how long initially things would sort of take to gel. And um, you, know, you anticipate like, okay, the, the, the doors are open, everybody's gonna come and everybody's gonna wanna buy. Um, that is, that is not the case. And I think you just need to be patient with yourself. You need to be patient with your business because it doesn't take one conversation for somebody to really get it and to understand the value. It, it probably takes 50 and sometimes it takes, you know, a couple of years and it takes, you have to sort of kiss a lot of frogs before you find the, um, the, the one that that is going to like understand and see the vision and, and want to do it and take a risk on an, a you know a new entrepreneur a new business on the other hand when you find those princes in the mix um those become sort of your guiding light and i was so lucky to have um a, a couple along the way who sort of like helped build the business with me like trusted the vision that i had and said, we're going to do this. And, you know, now a couple of years later, it's, it's awesome because it's like, it, it's really worked. And I think we have great relationship now with them as customers, but it certainly did not happen overnight. And it, you have to get really used to number one, getting ignored. Um, like ignored is like the even worse than no, because you keep on talking, trying to call somebody or, 
sending them emails and you're like, why is, why are they not returning my calls? Why, you know, all these things. And you got to learn to like, not take it up personally and just continue to do it because it's a numbers game and it's, it's going to take 50 touches before you get somebody who is going to listen to you and probably another year before they're going to actually write a check and say, all right, you know, my company is going to do this. So, um, I did not anticipate how long things would sort of take, um, to, to truly mature. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think that that, that was, that was the challenge and it's challenging to sort of like always, um, you know, maintain a good attitude when you want somebody to like believe in you from the beginning, but it's, it'll be worth it in the end. And I continue to tell myself that too. Yeah, but that's a great um, point. So many entrepreneurs are like, Oh, I'm gonna get rich in six months, all that kind of stuff, you know, but it takes a long time. Right. And like you see, you might have a conversation today, but it not pay off until like a year and a half from now. Right. Cause there's plenty of time today. I'll like, I'll have something good for me. I can trace it back to something that is like a year and a half ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I remember like, when, when Mark Zuckerberg first started big right with Facebook, you know, he just did, he did an interview and someone asked, what does it feel like to be overnight success? Oh, well, if overnight success is me coding my dorm room for four years, so I guess I'm overnight success, right? Oh my gosh. A absolutely. Whoever, t whoever says, oh, this was like an overnight success, they're absolutely lying. And either that or they're not truly successful uh, yet. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a long game. And I think that that's the good entrepreneurs. When somebody says I've been in business for 10 years, I'm like, I'm in admiration for them, you know, because the, it takes like 90% of startups or maybe 95% of startups fail within the first two years. And, um, uh, that I, I would never be part of that statistic. I mean, that like that, because I went through this um, sort of initial incubator program through a, a, a tech startup hub. And I kept on hearing, hearing that statistic. And that was my sort of like my guiding letter. <laughs> like the thing that I didn't want to happen, what, what kept me up at night was 95% of startups fail. And I'm like, that is never going to be Raven. And, it, in, in, and yet I saw a lot of my peers in that group who went out of business or got full-time jobs. And um, so you have to sort of have a, a strong stomach to take on some of the challenges that happen within the first two years um, and just and just work your butt off. I mean, it, it, it's not, I mean, like, like people who think that they're going to be an entrepreneur and have, you know, work-life balance. Um, no, no. I yeah, mean, yeah. If, you, if you have, if, if you are not so passionate that you are willing to work nights and weekends and like think about your business all the time, you're not, you don't have the passion for it. I'm sorry. Yeah. For me, like for me, a vacation is like a, a two hour break once a week to drink a beer, right? With a friend, right? That's my vacations. Absolutely. And even probably when you're drinking that beer, you're talking about your business. I yeah, mean, exactly. I mean, it, I gotta be careful not to like, let it be too consuming. But on the other hand, I mean, I think it's that drive that entrepreneurs have which is like, they're going to stop at nothing to make it work. And um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, balance is probably not so good. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a firm believer that only way to fail as entrepreneurs is you, if you quit, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. That's right. Bonnie, talk about why HR is important. I think HR sets the tone and the culture for a business. It's the function that makes or breaks the, the people equation of the business. And if you do not hire, manage, develop, and, um, you know, and, and, and choose the best people to run your business, um, it, it, nothing else matters. It's not going to fly. And I think HR has such a hand in crafting um, the people equation of business. And that people equation is a business's competitive value. So um, it's huge. Bonnie, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Yes. So um, this month, um, if you write a review about your 
HR project experience on our site. And you'll, you go to ravenintel.com and up in the upper right, it says add review. Um, we have about a, about a million places where you can click on add review um, and write a review about your implementation experience. We're offering a $20 uh, gift card to Grubhub so that you can you know, get lunch delivered um, to your, your office or your home office in a lot of cases. Bonnie, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Absolutely. So Raven Intel, Raven, R-A-V-E-N-I-N-T-E-L dot com is where you want to go. Uh, you can always email me at Bonnie at ravenintel.com. Happy to chat with you um, and be a resource for your HR project coming up. And for Alyssa, we'll have the link to her gift and her um, social media on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinsatelblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and your social media network. Bonnie, we're coming in with talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, well, the weekend is coming up, so enjoy it. Enjoy uh, being out in this great weather that we're having here. Thanks, Bonnie. Bonnie, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, 